Welcome at this uh, session. Um, today or this afternoon we have two different talks. Afterwards will be in other session as well. So this session will start with a presentation by Nathan Daly from um, Relational AI. And he will talk about if runtime isn't fun time, controlling compiled time execution. Can I go? Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Nathan. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, so yeah, this is titled, If Runtime Isn't Fun Time, uh, Adventures in Controlling Compile Time Execution. Um, and I'm going to be talking about our experiences at Relational AI. Uh, if you saw my very brief sponsor talk on Tuesday, you got a two-sentence summary of what Relational AI does. Um, so I will give you two more sentences um, real quick. We are uh, we're building a super high-performance database server and machine learning platform uh, combined in one system. Um, so I actually have three sentences for you this time. Um, we're going to be uh, we're going to be executing maybe uh, as part of that machine learning. We're going to be doing maybe thousands of aggregation queries, each of which over millions of rows of data, and all of that in a tight optimization loop over and over and over. And so it needs to be fast. We not uh, we want to make that loop as tight and fast as possible. So a lot of that for us is about trying to move uh, as much of that work into prep work as possible. Um, and so this is about our experiences trying to do that, moving work uh, from runtime to compile time. Uh, so I'm going to real quick give some background on like what I mean when I say those words, um, what the current mechanisms that exist in Julia are for kind of uh, addressing this problem. And the reason I'm talking about it is because then I'm going to cover some examples that we've run into in our work where um, it wasn't super obvious what the, uh, how to apply the current mechanisms to these problems. So I'll go through some problematic examples and then uh, cover some of our lessons that we learned from trying to use generative functions and uh, finally ask for your thoughts. So um, we're doing background now. Julia is a dynamic language. Um, uh, and to distinguish that, uh, the, the opposite would be a static uh, system. And when I say dynamic code, I mean that it's able to handle unknown or unexpected types, uh, where a static code uh, knows all the types in advance, so it might be able to be faster, but it's inflexible. Um, but Julia gets to be fast uh, as well, because it can optimize code to become static uh, if it can show that that won't affect the dynamic behavior. So in contexts where we, we can, we can give you fast uh, static code. And one of the ways we, one of, one of the parts of that optimization is pre-computing values, um, so your runtime is faster. Um, so real quick, this is what I'm talking about. This is an example of specialization, which is one of Julia's mechanisms for doing this. Um, uh, here we have a silly function that multiplies an input by its size in bytes for some reason. Um, and uh, you can see that if we pass it the integer two, we can use this code typed macro to see what is the compiled code that Julia is gonna com compute for, for this specific specialization. And it replaces this entire size of operation with just the value eight, um, which is the size of an integer, and it's a 64-bit integer. Um, and in, in many languages, you might expect this kind of dynamic reflection to be expensive because you have to like interrogate the, t the, the input and ask what, are your, what is your type and what's the size of your type. But in Julia's case, um, because we, uh, we specialize, we, we, we generate a, a specific um, method instance for every method invoked with new concrete types, um, we're able to compile this all into a single instruction. Um, and yeah, so that's specialization. It's fast because we know the type, so we know what, what code we should generate. Uh, the opposite situation um, uh, is if we don't know the types, uh, we run into what people call type instability, um, and you're going to be slow because uh, you don't know exactly uh, what code you need to generate. You need to be able to account for lots of possibilities. So here's uh, an unstable example um, where your input, this time we're doubling uh, whatever value you ask for out of this tuple, and you provide an index. And in this case, the type that we provide to this function is the same in both cases, but we get a different type out because some of these values are integers and some of these values are floats. And so whatever, uh, whatever uh, value we pass affects the type of the operation. Um, oh no, my code is, my, sorry, my slideshow is frozen and I don't know why. Oh no. It's working here. Oh, it is working there. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll just look up here now. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so here's the unstable code. This is the same function, almost, uh, except for this is way more expensive, right? Um, and that's because uh, we didn't know the type of those inputs to multiply. And you can see that uh, that union over there, it might be an int or it might be a float, right? But the fact is, this is actually the best the compiler could do, and it actually does pretty well with just a small union like that, um, because, uh, because you don't know. And that's actually not a bug, it's a feature. The fact that we could write this function in Julia at all is super cool. Um, in, a static, in a static language, you just aren't allowed to write a function like that where um, you're indexing and, and getting a different type based on runtime values. Um, so this is kind of, I think, uh, from my impression, this is Julia's philosophy where we let you write code, high-level code that works like you expect it to, uh, and then we try to make it fast when we can. Um, 
But in this case, that slow code's the best we can do. But sometimes uh, the slow code isn't the best we can do, but the, but the compiler can't get to the fast code for whatever reason. Maybe it's, it's just it doesn't have enough time or it just doesn't know how to do that yet. Um, and sometimes we really care about that performance, and sometimes we as the programmers know what, it should, what uh, optimized code it should be producing, and we want some way to tell the compiler that. So that's what we're talking about. All right, one more piece of background before I move on. Um, a lot of this work came from our time trying to optimize the fixed point decimal library, which is a package um, that's used for representing decimal numbers. Um, and you may have seen this before, but floats, most people represent decimal numbers with floats, uh, but they are imprecise. So here, like 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 does not equal 0 0.3, which is shocking. And if you're doing operations with money, that matters. You don't want to be uh, shaving off fractions of a cent or adding fractions of a cent. Um, and in the trade-off, we don't need 600 orders of magnitude. We only need a, you know, maybe 10. Um, so um, there's this type called fixed decimal, which implements this by um, actually storing an integer to store the value, since these don't have that precision problem, and then uh, keeping track of some number of digits that we use to represent um, the decimal portion of the number. So to represent the number 2.001 with three digits of uh, precision, we would actually store the integer value 2001, and then we just remember that the last three digits are uh, the decimal. And we remember that by uh, keeping that in the type. Um, and because the precision is in the type, the compiler can actually produce uh, fast code when we use these in practice. Okay, so that's, that's, that's it. We're gonna, this is the rest of my talk. That's the background. Um, so uh, Julia has a bunch of mechanisms for doing what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, uh, they, they, are, they vary from stage programming, metaprogramming, generic functions. Um, and I'm gonna just real quick give you an overview before I, I move on to the problematic examples. So we just saw specialization. Um, it's uh, this method that happens, it's this process that happens on every Julia method where we uh, generate new code for that method based on the input types and we're able to compile it to be fast um, because we know what all the types are. Um, macros are a tool that Julia has to let you uh, explicitly control what code Julia is gonna generate for a given input. Um, but that happens at parse time and not at compile time, so it's actually not relevant for the rest of the talk, so just ignore macros when, when you're watching everything else and know that um, they're really cool and let you write neat uh, syntaxes on top of Julia, but um, they, don't, they don't apply here. Uh, generated functions are basically just like macros, um, except that they happen at compile time. So you're able to um, specify manually for any uh, input types what, you, what the runtime code that you want that function to contain uh, should be. So you can give it a, a quoted um, piece of code and say, this is what I want you to generate when I, when I see these types. Um, and uh, pure functions, sorry, I'm moving through this list pretty fast. Uh, pure functions, uh, pure is an annotation that gives a hint to the compiler that a function can be evaluated at compile time because it's mathematically pure. So you promise it's always gonna return the same values for the same inputs, and so the compiler knows that it can, it can evaluate it once, it doesn't need to do it at runtime. And the last thing I had on this list is I included eval because um, uh, you can use eval in Julia to dynamically create new code, and, and so you can do the, the, the staging yourself if you generate a code quote, you can just eval it into a function definition and, and, and get the exact code you want. So sorry that was really fast. I'm gonna cover them again as we go through the examples, but I just wanted to start with an overview. And the rest of our time, we're gonna be looking at um, some problematic cases that we ran into uh, when we were doing our work that, um, where it's not obvious which of those solutions you can apply. So um, first I wanna talk about trying to do error checking on the type parameters of your input. We're gonna to return to the fixed decimal package. So um, even though it was quick, you may recall that um, this second argument to this type uh, is the number of decimal digits we wanna store in our type. And the first argument to our type is um, what type of integer we're going to use to store the value. Um, and so uh, in this case, if you're gonna to try to just um, create a fixed decimal to value one, but you wanna put it in this kind of type, you're gonna find that actually uh, you can't store five digits of precision in an 8-bit integer. And that's because um, one in that case would actually be 100,000 would be the number that you would store. Um, and the last five zeros would all be uh, decimal values. But 100,000 doesn't fit in an 8-bit integer. So um, uh, the fixed decimal package happily, uh, kindly, doesn't let you construct one of these things. 
Um, and we get this really nice error message that says uh, the requested number of decimal places is uh, five is too big. You can only have, for an 8-bit integer, you can only have zero, one, or two. And this is a really helpful error message because it not only tells you what's wrong, it tells you how you can fix it. And in fact, if we do try with two, um, we're able to store this just fine. The number one is actually stored as 100, and 100 is less than 255, which you can fit in an 8-bit integer, or, or 128 if you're um, unsigned. Uh, so this is great. We love understandable error messages. But we don't want to have to pay for those understandable error messages, especially not in, an in, in, a, in a loop. So this is in a constructor. Every time you add two fixed decimals uh, and it constructs the resulting value, you, you run this error checking. Even though those two integers have the same, those two fixed decimals have the same type and adding them gives you the same type, you're still gonna run this error checking on every operation. Um, and that's fine if it's cheap, but it's not fine if it's not cheap. And um, so this is, I had to like wrap the code around and this is what's happening right now in the, in the inner constructor. And we can see where it's happening here. This is, a constru this is the constructor for fixed decimals. Um, and um, basically it's doing this error checking where it's calculating what is the maximum uh, precision that will fit in my type. In that case it's two if you have an int eight. And then it just checks is the value f that you provided, is that greater than zero and less than two? And if it's not, it throws an error. That's, the, that's, that's all the logic there. And uh, this is clearly an example where the authors expected this to specialize away. Um, they wrote this code and they were like, this is gonna compile away because it's, a, it's an inner constructor. Um, there's even like nice quotes, nice uh, comments in here about like perform performance. Um, but it doesn't compile away like we just saw. And um, in fact, I think that I remember talking to people about it and, and this used to compile away at some point, but either that max x10 function has changed or the package has changed or Julia has changed, but for some reason it no longer compiles away. Um, and this is the problem. It's really hard to know when looking at code like this whether it's gonna compile away or not. Um, and it's, it's difficult to write unit tests that, that, that confirm that the code compiles to something reasonably small um, and in order to, to catch regressions. Um, and so we can show that if we just remove that error checking, we get the code we expect. It's a single operation. Um, so uh, yeah, ideally we want uh, some kind of way to stage that error checking and, and, and really tell the compiler that we wanna perform that entire operation ahead of time when you're compiling that function um, once. And then every time you use that type again, that it, you know, as long as it didn't complain when compiling, it's not gonna complain at runtime. Okay, uh, and this I thought was kinda of similar to the way we have the inline uh, macros where almost always it's best to just let the compiler figure out inlining, but sometimes for some weird reason you know better and, and, and you want that control. Um, and um, so you may be thinking in your head as you're watching this talk, well yeah, that's what pure functions are for, just mark this function pure. Um, and uh, if you're not thinking that, I'm gonna try to explain why you might have been thinking that. Um, so these are some of the options I think that might apply to the situation. Um, we covered specialization already, that's what the authors are currently attempting to use, but it turns out in this case it doesn't. Um, and uh, pure functions, as I briefly mentioned earlier, let you mark a function and say, hey compiler, like this is a hint that you can compile this away, I promise it's not gonna change at runtime. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I'll cover this more after the next example, but pure functions and generated functions both uh, suffer from this restriction that um, they are not allowed to call method tables that might change in the future. Um, and as such, they don't work for generic interfaces. So the problem here is because that T could be any user defined type, um, the, the functions that we're calling inside there could actually change at runtime and that's violating the promise that you have to make to use pure functions. So um, uh, we can't use pure functions here and it's not clear what else we can do. Um, Okay, so uh, the next example is really similar, but we're not just doing error checking, this time we wanna compute some value and then inject that value into future code. Um, just like the previous example, um, we always have the same output for the same types. Um, we uh, want our, our values are fully computable based on only that static information, the types and the constants in the, in the type. Um, and uh, one extra thing, we want the results to actually be available for inlining or other future static computations. So um, it, we can't just like compute the value and put it in a map and then look up the value from the map at runtime. Like we have to actually compute this uh, in a way that the compiler can get access to. Um, am, I, am I moving? Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, my slides are freezing. Okay, yeah, so um, here's an example that uh, I covered. Um, so uh, this is something we ran into where we just wanna compute for a tuple of types. We wanna compute basically zero of T for each T in that tuple. Um, so uh, a bunch of zeros. Um, another uh, example, uh, these ones all come from the fixed point decimals package. Um, we saw that max XP10 is calculated to for int eight. It's the biggest uh, precision that fit in that type. Um, uh, we wanted to calculate, um, this is also needed for fixed point decimals, the coefficient. Um, it's just that actual number, so for f is equal to two, this is 100. 
Um, so these are just things that we needed inside the fixed decimals package. We need the coefficient inside multiplication. And we don't want to recalculate that. Every time we multiply numbers, we might multiply a million numbers in a, inside of our loop. Um, and so we want to comp comp compute that once. And we actually want to get it in the assembly that's generated as a magic number. Um, so um, looking at that zero tuple, uh, another problem is that we have to be able to use this with user types. So um, it's not just going to be integers and floats that go in there. It might be a fixed point decimal. And so, yeah, you can write a zero tuple function with some clever tricks. Jeff helped me, helped me construct one um, that usually const folds, but if the type is sufficiently complex, it still doesn't. Um, and, but the thing is, like, we know this should be pre-computed. You're just, like, I, in, 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 uh, there's no way that the zero value can change um, based on any runtime situation, except, excuse me, uh, I forgot to put my computer on, do not disturb. Uh, that's fine. Except, of course, for, um, uh, actually changing the methods that, um, uh, sorry, within a given world age, there's no way that the value can change. That's, that's the point here. Um, so, um, yeah, same as before, it'd be nice to have some explicit way to request staging. Um, and again, you might be thinking in your head, I'm pretty sure this is what pure functions are for, and same as last time, uh, that's true, except that, um, uh, again, because we want to be able to use user-defined types, uh, for example, um, this, uh, the power the, the, the to the power of um, might be defined later or might change at runtime, and, that, and that's violating the requirements for pure. Um, so um, at least as is currently, those are the requirements for pure. It'd be maybe great if we could change that in the future. I'm not sure. But um, so uh, just to iterate that one more time, pure functions can't have any mutable, can't depend on any globally mutable state, which includes method tables, um, and that means that they don't work for generic interfaces. You can't uh, use user-defined types. Okay. And generated functions have exactly those same restrictions, um, uh, but it's actually enforced with the world age uh, freezing. Um, but in addition to that, there's, there's a recommendation that generated functions shouldn't really be used for generating values at all. They should just be used for generating code. And that's because of this world age freezing, um, you're going to get what we call 265 issues, which means that uh, if the user does change some definitions later, they would expect this to change, and generated functions won't, and they'll be sad. So. Um, uh, for those reasons, neither of these situations apply. And the last one I wanted to look at is eval. Um, you could just remove this double equals here and make it a single equals, and you could say, well, let me just, let me just eval this and just, just manually set the definition for this specific subtype to be this specific value and just do that for all the values you care about. And that would work, of course, if you knew what all those values were. Um, but uh, you might be computing complicated values um, in, your, in your application based on uh, some things that you can't know ahead of time. Okay. Um, so I wanted to do one real, real quick aside, um, which is about specializing on constants, not just specializing on types. Um, so uh, Linda and I ran into this example. Um, we've been scratching our head for the last week or two. Uh, one of those functions I showed earlier, the coefficient function, is extremely simple. It's just 10 to the power of some constant. Um, we really expected that this should, should const fold. Um, but, uh, and, and, in, and, and Linden kept being like, no, look, it does const fold. And he kept sending me the examples and his folded and mine didn't. And, uh, and here we see it does. And it turned out my problem was, uh, I had put five in there and he put two in there. And, uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen that like WAT programming video, but I, I, I had a WAT slide in here and I eventually removed it for time, but WAT. Um, and so, uh, um, it turns out that what's happening here is um, this, uh, the power uh, function is actually manually specialized via some uh, uh, special hard-coded specialization for power. Um, in the parser, from what I understand, we actually check to see if we can see that this is a, a constant and, um, and we have manual specializations for zero, one, or two, but uh, no bigger numbers. And so uh, this one doesn't cons and this one does. So, um, uh, I just wanted to have this real quick aside about specializing on constants. Julia doesn't have any mechanism right now to specialize on constants, but some languages do. Um, there are some multi-stage multi languages like Stratego, um, which lets you mark a, a variable as a value you want to specialize on if and only if it's actually known at compile time, and otherwise it just operates like normal. Um, so that syntax might be something like this. Um, you have this power function, you have x to the exponent, um, and uh, if you mark y as, um, Oh, so you can see my cursor, but if you mark y as a uh, specialized on variable, then all those other things inside brackets there um, would be evaluated at compile time if y was a compile time constant like it was in our coefficient case. Um, and if it's not, then you just proceed like normal and you have the regular power definition, um, which is, which is kind of neat. And we could imagine some kind of mechanism in Julia like that maybe allowed you to uh, 
dispatch on whether or not one of its arguments was a compiler.const. I know in Jeff's talk this morning, he was like, please stop dispatching on things that are inside the compiler. But, uh, you know, I don't know. We, we might be able to imagine something um, that looks similar and, and um, uh, allows you to do something like that. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about um, is um, uh, not generating different values for different types, but actually generating different code structure or different algorithms for different types. Um, so um, uh, what I usually mean here is you have some value and you want to do one thing if it's one kind of type and a different thing if it's a different kind of type. So in this example, maybe you want to do the first dot, dot, dots if it's a, if it's a float and the other dot, dot, dots if it's not. Um, and in this case, like, you could just write that. That's fine. Specialization will um, replace that check that is a check with just a true or a false, and then one of the branches will get deleted, um, and uh, you'll, you'll end up with just the code you expected, which is great. But sometimes you want to generate a more, a more complex code structure um, than just this if can express, and that's what Julia has generated functions for. Um, and this is actually not a problematic example. This is just like, aren't generated functions so cool? Um, and uh, in this example, you want to add to tuples um, uh, Point-wise, so we have like one, two, three, and four, five, six, and we want to add each of their elements together. And so we're basically trying to we're trying to generate this code on the bottom, um, which says add the first two things, add the second two things, and add the third two things. And um, excuse me, we can write this uh, generated function here, which which says, hey, we know how big these tuples are, and we know exactly what code we want to generate, so let's just do that. Um, and uh, yeah, generated functions are super cool. A lot of languages don't have any way to express that at all. Um, but uh, the, here, here comes the problematic part, which was that um, they looked too cool. And uh, at our company, we saw generated functions, and we're like, here's finally the answer for all these previous examples that I just pointed out. Here's a mechanism that lets you explicitly stage programming. You can say right here, uh, that's the code that I want to generate, and this is the code I want to run in the compiler. There's the runtime code, and there's the compile time code. It's, it's perfect. And um, so we ended up using them for all of these things that I've been talking about and, and others. Um, and this turns out to be a problem for a few reasons. Um, one of which is that because of the frozen world age, you, you're not allowed to use generated functions in generic interfaces. So like I talked about, it won't, it won't generalize to user-defined types that you pass in. Um, and it makes interactive debugging difficult if you're trying to change things at runtime. Um, and uh, uh, testing the code that they generate can be difficult. Um, and I understand that they, uh, there's a lot of overhead associated with generated functions. Um, and um, the big problem that, that, that kept us from seeing all of this is that generated functions act differently within a package than between packages. And I think this is actually a good thing, but it bit us. And a lot of this is all in the documentation, but I'm trying to provide it here as another form of documentation in case you prefer watching talks to reading docs. Um, it wasn't obvious to us, and uh, um, I came to learn these things by interrogating people. Um, and uh, the main thing is that inside of a package, the world age is frozen at the end of pre-compiling the package, so almost all the rules that I talked about that make generated functions difficult to use uh, don't show up within your single package, and so we wrote all our code as one big monolithic package because it's an application, so we didn't know that we had these problems, um, and now our code base is big and we can't break it up into smaller pieces because we start getting world age issues. Um, so uh, that was, that's the pitfall there that I, that I hope you can avoid after, after hearing this. Um, and the other, the other last rule about generated functions is, I, I, I touched on this earlier, but um, same as pure functions, your generated functions shouldn't really call generic functions um, because those definitions might change in the future and uh, then you'll be out of sync with the rest of the code because your world age is frozen and users will be surprised by this. Um, so uh, a consequence of that is you shouldn't be using generated functions to pre-compute values um, just for generating code structure. Uh, that last thing is really what pure functions are for, but, but as we showed in, 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 um, in some cases, you can't use pure either. So um, I breezed through that, um, but uh, uh, hopefully this talk has given you a more detailed understanding of uh, some of the use cases we came across um, for stage programming in Julia. Um, uh, we think hopefully there's, there's room to keep thinking about some of these issues, um, and, and we'd love to hear more about uh, solutions that other people might be able to think about. Um, we have the Slack channel for discussing this further, and you can also feel free to talk to me. Um, but, um, and yeah, as a, as a last summary, uh, we talked about um, uh, though Julia is a dynamic language, it can be fast through specialization and generation, um, but in some cases the compiler can't figure it out and we want to be able to tell it how to stage that code. 
Um, so uh, that's that. I actually uh, left off all the specific proposals we had maybe to fix some of these things or, or ideas that we had because um, I didn't want to seed the room with our bad ideas or my bad ideas, but i um, uh, uh, happy to talk more about those as well. So thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, um, so the question was, can I talk about those things that I didn't talk about? Uh, yeah, so um, here we go. Uh, so these are in no particular order. That's part of the problem. Um, this was for that first reinterpret. Um, I don't know that I actually like this, but something like this um, to tell the compiler, like, like this is what I, what, I, what I intend, is that this block is computed at compile time and isn't computed at runtime. Um, and uh, this somehow, I don't know if this, if this macro means please try harder to optimize this, maybe just like increase some of the um, heuristics to be a little more aggressive, or if this macro just means throw me an assertion error if you fail to compile and that's all it is and everything else is just normal. Uh, but, but it's something like make sure there's nothing in here that makes it into the generated code. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, Let's see, yeah, I think that's, this is very similar, but I was imagining maybe kind of like the if generated syntax where you could say like, hey, if you are able to figure this out at compile time, um, uh, uh, come in here and, and maybe if you aren't, show this error in the string at the end or, or this warning or something and, and you know, move into this block or the other block depending on whether you are or aren't able to compute at compile time. I don't know, these are just, just putzing around. I don't know how much more, um, oh, and this is when I was thinking about the specializing on constants. Um, uh, we were imagining like you could maybe dispatch on whether or not the value, I mean, whether or not the value is some kind of constant value, and if it is, you can promote it into the type domain because that won't incur any allocations because you know that it's a constant. Um, and so then, uh, so then the power function could just be written um, like this, sticking only in the type domain, and then this specializes to um, just the multiplications, and so then we wouldn't have that. We, we, you could you could do it for any number of for for, for any exponent. Um, so. These were some of the ones that I had had. Um, yeah. So if my little experiments now are realistic, I think there is a solution without going to all that and, and um, that is sometimes useful. And that is, is to <clears throat> utilize the fact that n-tuple uh, is declared in a way that does let you generate quite a lot of stuff uh, mm -hmm. at compile time. So one of the tricks that you can do for doing, let's say, arithmetic is, is that you can, you can essentially define arithmetic via the length of tuples. So what at least my little demo was able to do is you use uh, on your fixed decimal thing, you create a tuple of, that's, that has a length equal to the power of 10 that you want to create, and then you just sort of uh, iteratively multiply by 10, splitting one element off of that tuple with each one as you go, and then you return the result when you empty the tuple. Okay, so you're, you're, you're basically yeah. saying to, to just use this last definition of power, you don't even have to generate it, uh, just to do it with, with n tuple, but, but just know that you're always in the type domain already in that case, and just have your own definition of power. Well, so if, so if you're already, if you're taking this in here, oh, you, you basically your first step, uh, you call n tuple, that's your one generated element, right? Uh, so, so, so basically what it does is it isolates your usage of the generated function thing yeah. to something where you know it's going to be, you know, valid basically, yeah, right? And it doesn't sort of poison the rest of your stuff. And then you do everything on the tuple at that point, and then I was able to get it up to awesome. at least 15, but presumably yeah, went higher. I think that's reasonable. I think uh, 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 we only discovered that this was the problem yesterday. Um, yeah. But uh, I think uh, I think yeah, you could just write one that that knows it's a val. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But. Uh, first, a small comment, please don't use the length of tuples to encode integers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes the compiler sad. If it, you know, if you need to hack something, that's fine, but it makes the compiler sad. Uh, the other comment I had was, uh, would some sort of statically guaranteed effect system do what you need where you can say not constant fault this, but statically guarantee me that, you know, this has no side effects. Yeah. 
coupled with some sort of compiler guarantee that things that don't have side effects execute at compile time. Because it's, you know, it's not, like, guaranteeing constant folding is hard, because that, you know, you can't check, and we, you know, try to do a lot of things even if we don't have perfect information, right? And constant folding is fundamentally something you can only do if you do have perfect information. So, you know, it breaks all sorts of assumptions. But side effectness is a significantly more static property and could potentially be more easily checked and not interfere with optimization slash potentially be checked externally. And it seems like for the error case in particular, that might be sufficient. So do you think it is? And I think if what shall we talk about that? Yeah, we should definitely talk about it. I, I could see how that would apply. Um, I think um, I think we I, I think what what worries me a little bit about like even with pure is it this it's this implicit staging where um, even then you're marking the function to say this has no side effects and um, and and I can understand how that means to the compiler. Like, yeah, it's totally fine to pre-compute this once and 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 not have to run it at runtime. But it I think for maybe it's just a naming or an optics thing, but for people who are who are looking for this ability to um, have control over over compile time and runtime, it is surprising to see it encoded as this mathematical pureness, which a lot of our functions are pure, but we don't necessarily mark them as pure because we're not trying to get them to compile. You know, I don't know, I think that maybe there's some something nice about the explicitness of, of this, but but I think in general, I think in principle, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Thank you. Thanks to the picture again.